Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I wanted to start with Minchin and Andrew because um, neither of you actually started in the field that you are now known for. Um, you both actually started out in the corporate private sector, um, probably in a way as was expected, maybe by um, your community, um, our families, um, as second generation Asian American. So I want to hear a little bit from you, and actually this will go to Daniel as well, although he went straight to kind of his career goals. Um, what did it take for you to defy expectations of society, um, perhaps your family, and what gave you the courage to pursue your passion um, and what supported you to keep going? Because I know that before your success, there were probably many failures. And I'll start with Minjin. Oh, well, Jane, thanks so much for hosting us. I know you're really busy and thank you for taking the leadership role here. And hi, everybody. Hey, Daniel. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> hi, Andrew. Uh, I guess just to answer your question very briefly is that I got really sick. I had a very serious liver disease and I was told that when I was in college that I would get cancer in my 20s and 30s. And even then I kind of, I became a lawyer and I thought, oh, you know what? Um, maybe I don't want to die at my desk. So I thought that I would write a novel because I thought it would be so simple to write a novel. And then I quit being a lawyer and then it was not so simple to be a writer. I'm perfectly healthy now. I've been cured. I did have a very serious liver thing, but then I've been cured. But that process took an incredibly long time. But I, I mentioned the illness because it almost took mortality for me to figure out that maybe I shouldn't do what I don't want to do. So I ended up becoming a writer, but I failed for, oh golly, over a decade. So it, I had to be afraid of dying, basically. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll come back to asking what kept you going, but I'm going to go to Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say I had a similar story minus the, the health. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was an unhappy corporate attorney for a, a little while, and I just thought, wow, like this job involves me being as negative as I can imagine. Like that's not something <laughs> of the way I should be trying to spend my adulthood. So let me start a business, and then I made the great mistake or great decision to tell everyone I knew what I was going to do. Uh, and then when it failed, everyone knew I'd failed. <laughs> but at that point, you know, you, you sort of embarked on a new path. And as hard as it is, uh, you want to keep going. And my parents were concerned when I left the law, uh, especially after my business failed. They told people I was still a lawyer. I guess that's an Asian thing. Uh, and they weren't that excited when I decided <laughs> to run for president either. <laughs> no, they became excited later. So I have a history of disappointing my parents and eventually uh, winning them back over. Um, so, so I guess that, that that's like the confidence that they'll still come back around if I can just, uh, you know, demonstrate that it was not that terrible a move. Um, I'm going to go to Daniel next um, a little bit. I think it's something that many of us face. I, I know I certainly faced it when I decided to become a community organizer, I actually sat on my business card, me organizer, and then run for office. Um, what was it like for you to defy expectations and pursue your dreams? Uh, it's a good question. And by the way, Jane, I just want to compliment you on your virtual background. Your house was beautiful, but this this is also equally beautiful. Uh, so, <laughs> nice production values there. Uh, look, I, I think uh, that every one of us on this panel is continuing to defy expectations. I don't think that it is a, it's a question that's posed in the past tense. Uh, I think we have a, a long way to go, and, and, and I think all of us are on a journey to kind of, to, to, toward progress. Uh, and I think that's why we're fighting so hard uh, right now during this election. There's a lot at stake for all of us, our generation, and more importantly, uh, possibly the, the next generation. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's when, when you talk about defying expectation, it's really about trying to expand notions of, of who Asian Americans are in this country and how valuable we can be uh, so that we can actually open doors for generations to come. They should totally cast you as a president in a TV show or movie, Daniel. <laughs> like, it's a crime, yeah. I, I was like, that's such a I great don't idea. Think, I don't think Andrew's the first to say that, actually. I think many of us are saying that oh, Daniel no. should be cast as yeah, no, uh, president. I'm just, I'm just conveying it uh, for, for this panel. 
I'll do I'll do it, you know, in, in like uh, in, in uh, fantasy life, as long as you do it in reality, Andrew. It's okay to lose, Daniel, to see who can get that role first. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> I like the little competition that's going. We're gonna side. We're gonna start a side wager. But I did just want to announce that we have hit one hundred thousand dollars for this yes, event. Yes, way to go! So nice. Thank you to our community. I, I did want to. I did want to go back to the question of, you know, what it feels like to lose or to experience disappointment in the pathway. Because I'm sure that you've experienced it um, at Hollywood, in the publishing industry, um, in politics. Um, it's not easy, and it's also it really isn't expected for Asian Americans to enter this field. And I think we're often told um, to try something else because we haven't had, we haven't seen so many successful role models that look like us. Um, this past Friday, as I mentioned, we lost a giant in our community, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I know one response that I saw over and over in social media was just incredible depression um, and anxiety over this loss. And, you know, folks on the other side say, pick yourself up, pick yourself up. And, and so in this time when people are just feeling so low um, with the current political climate, you know, how do you keep going in the face of loss and disappointment and people telling you you can't do it? Well, first, I want to congratulate you, Jane, for being such an awesome candidate and leader and you yourself out there to as high a degree as really anyone in our community. Uh, and uh, in terms of how we keep going, at least for me, I've been very fortunate where there are so many people that got behind me in my campaign that now I, I feel like this obligation or responsibility to just keep on pushing because people have given the ability to make a difference. You know what I mean? Uh, and I did not have that ability not that long ago. So now that I have it, I'm going to use it to, to the best uh, I can to try and move our, us in a positive direction. I think the toughest time was really in your 20s when you're not a fully formed adult. In my case, I was still to get dates. And so if you don't have your professional life figured out and you're asking people out, <laughs> like, like it's, always, it's not a great combination. Uh, and so when, when you start hitting your stride, in my opinion, both personally and professionally, like those two things start reinforcing each other. Uh, and I'm su super indebted to all the folks that make it possible for us to do good work. I know Daniel must feel the same way about his legions of fans from Lost On. And they, you know, oh my gosh, now, now you're like this literary powerhouse. We're going to see uh, Pachinko on Apple TV where they're spending a bajillion dollars on it. Uh, so really like the toughest time is like that dark, the, the darker parts of the journey when you don't know how the journey is going to, to wind up. Uh, and certainly, I feel very, very strongly to support the next generation of Asian Americans of any field, because I remember that journey very, very well. Can we go to Minjin? Sure. I think that I'm so good at talking about failure because it's like my primary subject. <laughs> I, I mean, I failed as a writer for such a long time, and I feel really honest about it. And I think that you know, this despair that we feel, the sense of lamentation that we feel when we do lose somebody as important as Justice Ginsburg. And for me, she was very important because I was a lawyer and to see a person like that, also just doing the right thing and to fighting for the difficult things because it is so hard because it's, I've been a lawyer and I know that it's okay to be a lawyer, but it's one thing to be a lawyer. It's another thing to be a lawyer to do the right thing. Hmm. Difficult, di different things. Absolutely. So, and I think you mean they're not always the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you know, of our former professions, people actually dislike us. <laughs> I don't know why, but I want to just talk because I, when you talk about how do I keep going, a lot of it's because I think about the next generation. I think a lot about telling the truth about the difficulties of how to get there. And I also want to talk about mental health. It's a very important topic for me because when you do feel a sense of despair, very often Gen X and boomers have told millennials and Zoomers that they don't have a right to feel this way. And especially in our community, I think it's important to recognize that you can actually have grief and you can also have, um, you know, repair. You can have grief and repair and you can have healing and you can also be honest about the process of how difficult it is. And if you're honest about it, I actually think it's possible to keep going. So one of the things I really caution folks is to not deny the fact that you're upset about losing your goals mm -hmm. and 
to just to keep going and to find encouragement by being honest and to build. I, I really lo loved what um, Speaker Pelosi said about not, you know, agonizing, organizing. I think things like this make it really possible for me to not feel a sense of despair because look at our numbers, look at how much we can do just by being together. And that gives me a lot of courage. And I think that people like Andrew and Daniel really do give me courage because they're being fully themselves. And I think that's something that's really important. It's not even about defying expectations. It's what are our expectations? Mm -hmm. To even know them, that's a pretty cool thing. Thank you. Daniel. One thing I'll say to, to the young oh. folks out there, no one ever would have, I'm sure if they'd seen me or probably Daniel and Minjin at a certain point in our 20s would have thought that person's going to run for president someday or that person's going to be a <laughs> like, like they, they wouldn't have known. Uh, so, uh, so just know that is that we, we might not have even known it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, Andrew, just to add to that, I remember when I did um, win a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, a young Asian American woman came up to me and a high school student and she told me my mom told me that I could be just like you that I can you know be on the board of supervisors and I remember feeling both just like you know gratitude to know that immigrant parents are expanding you know beyond just doctors and lawyers but then also feeling a little bit of um, dismay because I also remember the pressure that my parents gave me to become a doctor or lawyer not wanting that type of pressure to be on the next generation. But I saw Sean Nguyen, 22 year old, who said it's so great to see Asian Americans in all these different roles speaking. And, and Daniel, I want to, to go to you about your experience with failure and loss and how you were able to you know, keep going down the path that you, you've been on. Sure, um, you know, I will tell you that, uh, you know, having a career as an actor means that you have to reconcile yourself to failure. Even the most successful actors fail more than half of the time. And if you're a young actor, start, when you're starting out, you're failing at least 90% of the time. Uh, and um, I won't lie, it's not easy. It's not easy, you know, when, uh, you know, in this career, the product, so to speak, is yourself. So it's hard to separate failure uh, from an assessment of your own self-worth. And that's where, you know, Ninjin's answer, I think, is really right on the money about mental health and, and resiliency. Uh, and sometimes, even now, I ask myself why I keep going because it is difficult. And and people tend to think that you know it's only difficult when you start, but once you get to a certain level, everything is really easy. And that's just <laughs> not the case. You know, I think what's more true is that the higher you go, the thinner the air. And so it, you actually find uh, challenges that you never expected uh, when you started. Um, but to be honest, what keeps me going are two things. Um, both Andrew and Minjin talked about the importance of the next generation. And as a father myself, I'll tell you that a lot of what I do is so that, you know, I, I can create the world I want to see for my children uh, because they are inheriting all of our problems and all of the things that we couldn't accomplish, they will be forced to because we are, the issues that we're facing cannot be kicked down the road like a can. You know, eventually, you know, the road is going to hit a dead end and, and, and it may with their generation. But I will also say that where I gather a lot of strength is from people like you all, like Minjin and Andrew, Jane, you too, the entire community, because you guys are doing the things that 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 everyone aspired to do. And we were told that we could do like one day, maybe you could be president. Andrew, you took that to heart and, and, and you wanted to, you want to make it a reality. Now, it's really important that we tell fellow Asian Americans that these are not pipe dreams. These can be realities. And so when I see incredible works of art like Pachinko, and when I see my fellow actors and comedians like Ronnie Chang, I know you're out there doing what they do, I get inspired. And when I see when I see politicians doing what they do, I mean, my first inspiration was Dan Inouye from Hawaii. And when I see those kinds of role models, it, it that's what powers me to keep going because I know that I can I can do it. I can I can do something like them. And I think that's why something like this is so important. Because everyone who's watching it might be able to say, look, these people have done it. They're doing it. They're trying it. Why can't I or why can't my kids? You know, when I um, finished my, my two terms on the Board of Supervisors, uh, someone asked me, 
what I had learned in office. And I answered without hesitation. I learned how to be fearless. But I realized when the young woman walked away that it wasn't actually a very honest answer because I was scared the entire time. Right. Every time I walked into a negotiating room, every time I took a controversial vote, every single time it was incredibly scary. But what I learned was how to sit with both fearlessness and fear at the same time. Um, the fear never goes away, actually. Um, it, yeah. You know, it doesn't Courage go away as you get older as you get. Fear. Courage is not right. the absence of fear. It's the management of fear. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is, this is a scary time for many of us. I mean, uh, the pandemic, something that we have not, you know, experienced for generations, one of the most unique um, world experiences. For those of us here in California, as I mentioned, we're experiencing these fires. And of course, on the Southeast, we're seeing floods and hurricanes. Um, the climate change that we've been talking about for 40 years that we have not addressed um, occurring during this time. And, and so, you know, what does it mean to, for you to be an Asian American and a seen Asian American mm -hmm. um, in 2020? And I'm going to start with Midgen and go to Andrew. I think for me to be an Asian American in 2020 is to really re remember where I came from. And I'm an immigrant, I'm a naturalized citizen, so I remember very distinctly from coming from Korea. And I'm from Elmhurst, Queens, which is a working class blue collar neighborhood. So the reason why this event appealed to me so much, and I've turned a lot of things down and I know you guys have too, and it's because we are trying to reach our communities in the original languages through ethnic newspapers and through ethnic media. And that's incredibly important because when I think about where I draw my inspiration, it's from leaders, but it's also from ordinary people who are completely being um, ignored, rendered invisible by both media and also by the leaders. And they're being used in two really weird ways. They're being used by the leaders to be either a wedge against other people of color, or <laughs> they're being used as some sort of pestilence, but it's, but neither are true, right? And we also have this idea that all these Asians are really rich. Again, completely not true. So when I think about what it means to be an Asian American in 2020, it's to be, it's, it's to be honest about where we're from, who we're really made out of, what our demographic looks like, and what we want. And what we really want is we want to belong. We really want to belong in an honest way without pretending to be something that we're not. Amen. And Andrew, before I, I go to you, because I know that you have a little less time than our other panelists, um, Ronnie Chang also asked this question. What do you tell the more apathetic and cynical people in the Asian American community who think being involved in politics is pointless? I wish I could stay here all night. I just texted that other people here tonight. Uh, it's it's an amazing gathering. I also sense I have a lot of friends in the Zoom. <laughs> you know, all that I've known for quite some time. You're, you're getting a lot of shout outs, Andrew. Uh, I think being Asian American uh, in 2020 is to become actually fully three dimensional and human in American life in a way that has not been true uh, previously. Um, and it's out of necessity, unfortunately, where I grew up in a household that did not talk a lot about American politics. I was certainly not getting the message, you can run for president someday. <laughs> like, like that was not the, the kitchen table conversation uh, in my household. Uh, it was more like get good grades, keep your head down, get a good job and, and try and establish a place in America. Uh, but we are being forced to become more engaged in my opinion because uh, of this pandemic that's accelerated a lot of negative things, but it's also amplified the sense of hostility and empathy towards Asian Americans in our community. We can all sense it. No, it, it's, and so the question is, what do you do? And to me, the, the choice is very clear, engage at higher levels, vote, raise our hands, say, look, we are just as American as everyone else. We're going to demonstrate it by voting, by contributing, uh, by fighting for what we believe in, the future of this country, what it should be, and that's why I appreciate all the people here. And this is a, a way to answer Ronnie's question, is that if we allow the narratives to be constructed for us, that then we will never actually realize our place in this country and our potential as not just a community, but as individuals, as families, as people that want something better for our kids. Uh, so to me, it's a very, it's like a non-choice. Like there is no choice in the matter. Like we have to actually roll our sleeves up and do things that we have not done as a community at as high a level 
um, as frankly, people in other communities. And that's what tonight represents to me because Asian Americans have not voted, have not donated, have not volunteered, and have not run for office as at high a level as people from other communities. It's one reason why I appreciate you so much, Jane, is that you are breaking the mold. You know, like I broke the mold in a particular way, um, though I will say that Jane has won more elections than I have. <laughs> so but I've, I've lost that. just as many as I've won. Six elections. But still, I mean, uh, so the, the, the role models on this call really, uh, to me, I think, Jane, you're as big as anyone because of what you represent, that we need to engage politically in a way that has not been the case for our community. So let's show what we do. And I will say, if we get out in force and help Joe and Kamala win, this could be the major political awakening that Asian Americans uh, have been waiting for for a generation or more. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I just, I have to tell you, the first time I saw you on the Democratic Party debate stage, I, um, you know, I, I, you know, I was working for another candidate. And so I had not been thinking a lot about your candidacy, except it was just amazing to see you there. But the moment uh, your opening remarks started and your face just took over the screen, I, I actually cried. I, I got so emotional. I did not realize how much it would mean to me to see an Asian American on a debate stage as a serious contender. And you beat out senators and governors. I mean, you made it all the way. And I just want to say that I was so, so proud to watch you. And Thank you, Jane. We love Bernie too. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't mentioned his name yet.